our last speaker is Olivier Albert Gönsch. Now we switch a little bit to uh, you. He probably won't tell us a lot about an an analytics, but now more on the issue of uh, law and, and ethics. Oliver Halberger is a lawyer, mainly active in the field of ICT and intellectual property law, with a focus on privacy and data protection law, licensing, internet and software law. Oliver Halberger made his bar exam in 2012 and is since then working as a lawyer in Zurich and as legal consult a counsel for, again, how is it? Spatulity. That's up here. He is currently writing his PhD thesis on IT law at the University of Lucerne. So you see now we will have a very, very different perspective on the issue of data, data science. But actually it is, it is sometimes very important how it influences our uh, work. So privacy in the big data area. Thank you for this nice uh, introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to give you some legal uh, aspects with regard to big data or uh, algorithms. So, what will you expect in the next approximately 20 minutes? First, I give you a short introduction where I'm standing with respect to the technology and with respect to our uh, legal. And uh, this leads to the question what is big data from a legal perspective? And this then is the question what is the profiling? What is, uh, what is this for a method? And with that, what are the questions with respect to uh, legal questions uh, to the profiling with respect to privacy and data protection? And as a last point, for what is, where are we? Which answers uh, could be given? Which uh, answers are still open? And uh, what's the road before us? So, data have become a current flowing into every day into every area of our life, how we communicate, how we spend leisure time, how we use our media, how we conduct business, has dramatically changed uh, into the internet. And the internet has in turn moved into our smartphones, in our tablets, in our variables, uh, into our devices, screening around uh, our homes and cities, uh, in factories and offices. And so the, real, the resulting explosion of data and discovery is changing. As we look at this dynamic change in our data-driven world, we see a global dialogue polarized uh, along competing but fundamental principles put it in a variety of directions. Industry, government and also civil society are unclear on how to find a balance between the interest of privacy and data protection and the interest of companies using their data. Now, as an either, either larger amount of data is digitized and travel across organizational boundaries, there is a set of policy issues that will become increasingly important, but with respect to privacy and data protection, but not limited to. There are the, uh, legal uh, fields which are important, such as uh, liability, intellectual property issues. For example, what data can be used by a company? How can they use data? Can they use sensitive data, for example? How is it if a company use um, normal data and but in combination of this data they have sensitive information? Who owns a piece of data and at last who is responsible if um, data is not correct and therefore um, somebody will be damaged? We from Sky Chility try to address these technological and legal issues, combine them and provide uh, a legal a governance framework and to help our clients to find here a good solutions. And I'm very proud to give you some insight in this process today. So, big data. The question I often hear and the first question I often hear from my cost our customers is what's this big data all about? What's the matter with it? We already have a superb IT infrastructure. Um, why do we have to change it or adopt it? And I understand this objection. However, the question is not if there is an optimized IT infrastructure today, but if there is one tomorrow. By defining 
deter big data. It very depends on the stakeholder. Um, what do we understand from a legal perspective from big data? The classical approach is uh, coming from Gartner and uh, McKinsey. Uh, they understand big data as a high volume, high velocity, and high variety. Uh, information, as, information assets that demand cost-effective, innovative forms of information processing for enhanced insight and decision making. A more, uh, a more technical approach comes from computer scientists, uh, like a term describing a storage and analysis of large and or complex data sets using a series of techniques including but not limited to NoSQL, Hadoop, MapReduce, Impala, etc. Now we see for the time being there is no final definition of big data. And some of my colleagues, lawyers, said, well, nevertheless, uh, it's absolutely unnecessary to define it because it's just technology. I don't share this opinion because as a lawyer, I'm very confident to have a definition and to, with that big definition, I can handle uh, a specific case. So I think that it's very important to find here a definition. In a privacy context, the term big data typically means data about an individual or a group that might be analyzed to make a correlation about an individual or a group. So to make a correlation between data and then the analyzing of this data, that's the key element of big data from a legal perspective. And this leads me to the term Profiling. I mentioned it at the beginning that the way we communicate, how we conduct business, etc., has dramatically changed. What did I mean by that? One of the most challenging issues in our society is to, that we are faced with an ever expanding mass of information. Uh, we are faced with information from journals, emails, tweets, blogs, phone calls, etc. Now, the selection of the relevant bits of information seems to be become more important than, than the retrieval of the data as such. If an information society is a society with an exponential proliferation of data, a uh, knowledge society must be done, must be one that has learned how to cope with this and profiling technologies seems to be one of the most promising methods to create order in that chaos. What's the definition of profiling? Profiling is a way to generate knowledge uh, by means of algorithms or patterns of correlations between data. The correlation stands for a probability that things will turn out the same uh, in the future. That what they provide is a kind of prediction based on past behavior. Correlation indicates, the correlation indicates uh, a relation between data without establishing a cause or reasons. I give you here an example. A correlation may be found between people living in a specific neighborhood and having a particular level of income. Or a correlation may be found between people having a specific skin type and the disease diabetes. What is happening that those people build a category having specific attributes and other people, not in this group, have the same categories, the same attributes, and with that, a prediction of future behavior may be possible. So the purpose of profiling is to predict one's future behavior based on correlations. The problem of this approach is that it, take, it extrapolates from the past to the future based on blind correlations tending to see the future uh, determined by established established probabilities and possibly disabling uh, potential better solutions. As Niels Bohr already in 1976 said, it's difficult uh, to predict, especially in the future. Now, as a lawyer, I ask myself, what law is applicable? What are the threats to privacy? Can someone consent uh, to such a data analysis? Is the concept of anonymization um, of personal data sufficient? In short, what is the balance between the interest of everyone's privacy and the interest of company using their data? And we at Skychidity combine those questions in 
this so-called governance framework uh, with respect to technology, IT security, customer view, and legal aspects. And I'd like to provide you today with some aspects of privacy and data protection. First, the question is then, well, what law is applicable? Obviously, the data protection law, because we proceed with data, but there are other laws too. Now, with respect to the data protection law, or the Federal Act on Data Protection, uh, this law, the protection law, does only apply on processing of personal data, meaning any information relating to an identified or identifiable individual. Other data than personal data is out of scope of this law. Now, one person is identified um, in a, by a specific information related to that person, example, by the name, the passport, or the social security number. More interesting is, when is a person identifiable? An identifiable person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly, in particular by reference uh, to an identification number or to one or more factors specific to his physical, physiological, mental, economical, cultural or social uh, identity, in short, with context information. If one individual is identifiable, it has to be uh, answered in each specific case. And the Supreme, the Swiss Federal Supreme Court uh, said that to determine this, it has to be asked two questions. First, um, must, according to one's experience, be expected that someone will take enough time and money to identify a person? And second, what kind of data are the basis for the identification? Well, these two requirements were probably okay in the 80s, where the Swiss data protection law was uh, set in forth, force. However, with big data analytics, um, these two requirements are quite unclear because today with Hadoop, Impala, etc. Um, and other big data technologies it's absolutely possible to proceed a huge amount of data and it's absolutely possible um, to identify a person within this context information and this uh, cheaper uh, than uh, as it was possibly before. Uh, now, one possibility to bypass the law would then be to anonymize data, anonymize data. So as long as the data are fully anonymous, the data protection law would not be applicable. In the process of anonymization, the data itself would be there, but some pieces then would be removed or um, would then be removed, such as name, address, etc., gender, age, etc. The issue with anonymization is the re-anonymization. With big data technologies or algorithms, it's absolutely possible with respect to time and cost to re-anonymize data. Missing pieces like name, gender, age can easily be replaced by other attributes. Now, the Supreme Court does not say that anonymization must absolutely be possible. They say it's okay when there is no reasonable expectation to, uh, that someone will take enough time and money to reanalyze the data. Here again, we see the same argumentation as here, and that's not quite a clear, a clear solution for this issue. If we conclude that an anonymization is usually possible or not possible, then the data protection law is also applicable. So how do companies nevertheless use their data? In practice, they inform the data subject about uh, the use of his or her data, provide their consent. The consent is usually given by the terms and conditions of the company. Here are an example um, of such terms and conditions. Now, Google changed recently their terms and conditions with respect to privacy. Uh, data protection. Has everybody, every somebody of you uh, read those terms and conditions? No, usually not. Nobody is reading this. So how then is it possible that you know that you are aware of what uh, will be done with your data? That's in fact not possible. Consent requires 
and he agreed to give them a specific informed indication of his uh, wishes by which data the data subject signifies his agreement to personal data relating him um, being proceed. Consent requires, from a legal point of view, that the data subject is fully aware of the consequences of his decision. Freely given means that the data subject was under no pressure to accept the terms and conditions. Now, fully aware of the consequences means the following. Who is responsible for the data and the data processing? Which categories of data will be processed? For what purpose they are processed? How the processing is done, phases and data flows? To whom data are transferred? That decision of consent is voluntarily and what the consequences of the refusal of the consent and audited consent may be revoked at any time. Now, by profiling an individual, such an informed consent is usually not possible. The purpose of profiling is to find correlations with algorithms, um, which are often unclear, unclear, fuzzy, and unexpected. There are two interesting uh, data protection principles which I like to focus. According to the collection of personal data and in according to the data protection of personal data may only be processed for the purpose indicated at the time of collection that is evident from the circumstances or that is provided by law. In addition, the collection of personal data, you see this here in uh, paragraph four, um, the collection of the personal, personal data and in particular the purpose of its process must be evident to the data subject. I'll give you a real example. A very famous case in 2012 was the Hugo case and the federal uh, court in Lausanne decided in its judgment that the, that the purpose of the Google cars with their rooftop cameras is not sufficient to meet the requirements of the duty to provide information even if the product concerned is very well known, the Google Maps, uh, in the absence of further information, people are simply not aware that the object of the exercise is to travel roads, making photographs, pictures, and publish them into the internet. Now, through big data analysis, data is hardly covered uh, by the purpose indicated at the time of collection of data. The data controller is looking for correlations between the data at the time of processing. In consequence, the data subject cannot be aware um, of the related data and to what purpose data will be processed. Stephen Hawking said once, the world has changed far more in the past 100 years than in other centuries in history. The reason was not economical, political, but technological. So, where are we in five years? The law, we can conclude, the law uh, is once more overtaken by technology. With the opportunities of new algorithms, big data technologies, a bunch of new legal questions emerge and cannot be fully answered through the current uh, legal framework. Therefore, because of that, uh, the actual privacy and data protection law will be reformed. The European Union is making huge progress in that discussion. Um, they have a concrete example how a new legal framework for privacy uh, should be. There are new ideas and concepts in the pipeline, and we assume that Switzerland will follow mostly uh, in, this, uh, in this discussion. Now, it's my personal uh, opinion that after the current big data hype, there will be, and there still some are, very interesting uh, business models. And for that reason, the pressure to us lawyers will, uh, uh, will be higher to, to provide a workable legal framework. As a last example, driverless cars. To be honest, two or three years ago, nobody really thought that it would be possible to drive a car without a driver from Lausanne to Geneva. Now we have evidence that it is possible, not only in Switzerland, but in Germany too, and of course in the US. And with that technological improvement, new business models are possible. And with that, new legal questions arise, of course. I thank you very much. Thank you very much for the
this uh, interesting talk. I'm a little bit confused. Maybe you have questions. Do you know about European laws when it's taken into action and really come? Uh, no. Yeah, well, there is no concrete date. However, on scale of the the discussion, however, is quite far. Now they have a concrete plan. Um, we expect that at the end of 2015 there is, well, hopefully, a final version. Okay. Um, but when a new law will be set in force, we don't know. Maybe one year, maybe two years. And Switzerland is another topic too. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. More questions? <coughs> yeah. Do you think this? You know, because uh, once you can have the laws about privacy, and another thing is the reality, you know. So we are data miner, more or less, yes. So it's possible to, to and it's just a rhetoric question, that, you know, against clever data miner, it's practically impossible to protect it. I mean, that even if you have, uh, you know, some medical data or whatever, you just remove the identity. But you will have a pattern of data like, like you know, trajectory, how he, he was moving, or, or events, or something like that. So, and even I was acting, you know, in medical data. And uh, on one hand, uh, people are writing papers like uh, identifying persons on the gate patterns, or you know how they go, how they move, or identifying based on, on electrocardiogram. And it's purely medical data. Mm. Well, so of course you can you can you can, you can falsify it, uh, but then it is useless and uh, let's say cause harm to people based on the wrong data. So I, I go say, you know, do you prefer to be re-identified or dead? So if you use the data for research, you need good data. On the other hand, clever guys now you don't need so much, uh, you know expenses to, to, to know almost everything you really want. Well, if I understood your question right, that's the so main question, question is that an organization possible or not? And what is the distinction between personal data and the overall data? So, for example, for a research um, or for medicine improvements, medical improvements, then if as long as a person cannot be identified, that's no problem to use that data. And however, if some company wants to identify a person for segmentation, to, um, to buy products to a specific individual, well then this is, we see currently a forever, uh, really an issue. I don't know, I, I just remember vaguely a case in the States. They release data in uh, public uh, research data about a social issue that was, which was very sensitive. But the data has been anonymized, so that it was not known. Fifteen years later, with big data, Google and all these things, they were able to identify quite a few of these people. So, fifteen years ago, everything was okay. But later, about two or three years ago, it was not that okay anymore. So, this data, and it was a good, I mean, the reason was to say, well, that public research, and we collect the data, and we want to distribute the information. But finally, it ended up that it was a disaster because people got caught in this analysis. So we don't know what is in 15 years. And time and now, 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 what are we doing? So I, I, I think it's so, such a, a demand on this question what can we do and also what kind of data should be avail available publicly. I mean particularly if it's personal or in a study or whatever. We have always been in mind that the data protection on Switzerland was established in the 80s and the idea was coming from uh, Germany and also from UK uh, in the 70s. So and, and at some point there was no progress uh, and to say well if the concept of anonymization is still workable today, there yeah, are strong uh, indices that it is not that we have to, to come uh, to find other solutions. Yeah. That is 
general problem to find a balance between uh, those different uh, interests. With respect to labor law, there I would say that's quite clear because between an employee and an employee you have a contract. And usually if you agree to a contract uh, with respect to labor law, um, then you agree that uh, the company is surveying you how, how you work, how you use internet for example. And, um, how, for example, to uh, if you if you use chats, etc., and the company has a, a, a big power here to go really deep into uh, these uh, views as long as it uh, touches the employment contract or the, uh, the employment chip. But the other thing is, if you are not an employee of a company, uh, for example, if you're using Facebook, Twitter, etc., and uh, this, those companies using this data to profile you, to make segments, are sold also sold this data to other companies. Um, then, yeah, the situation is quite unclear. How to, to finance, find this uh, balance? Okay. Another question again from the back. Remark no, because. It's not so much the problem of re-identifying but use of the use, you know, what is still good use. And then of course the question of the good guys for the bad guys. And since the last a few months I like this example of the German wings plane, where you have total inversion, you know, of good guys and bad guys. And for example, you know this accident, the suicide. Yes. Where the bad guy was inside and the good guys were outside. And on the other hand, we are reading now about the old medical history of this pilot, and some people complain why did we uh, knew it, know it before. But of course, according to the laws, before he killed anybody, he was absolutely protected. So he consulted the, the doctors, and they were obliged not to tell it. And now people, uh, so, so, so it is quite the good test, are the bad test, and also how harmful it is. Because, for example, if you make it, you know, even Often in the uh, newspapers, have pictures with, you know with faces um, erased. So, but somebody can have some piece of clothes that can be erased. That was. So, making pictures in public should be prohibited soon. Or we go back to the old village, you know, 300 years ago, where you can hunt people and you simply behave decently because everybody knew everything and you lived with it somehow. Well, I or think it's thousand years. again the question to find the balance, and I don't think that is a solution to go back to years ago. There is also with this uh, German Wings example uh, the right of other people to have uh, information uh, to this information. And um, so this is the public opinion, and this is a right too, which has to be considered, not only of this pilot and the family and the daughter. Of Giles, but also to talk. Okay, let's thank Oliver Heiberg once more and